Shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Roofer Report, brought to you by Roofer.com. Hey everybody, welcome to the Roofer Report. I'm your host, Pete McKendrick, and I'm glad to be back with you guys again here to talk about some more topics on how to successfully run a roofing business. Today's topic is, is one that comes up on Facebook quite often, probably once, twice a week. Where can I get leads from? How do you guys generate leads? How do we better generate leads? How do we get quality leads? And every time we see that, we get the comment in there of, hey, you just got to hustle. Hey, maybe I'm a new business. How do I get leads? You just got to get out there. You got to knock doors, right? You got to canvas these neighborhoods and get out there and spend all your day in the field and knock as many doors as you can. And eventually that hard work is going to pay off. And to some extent, yes, but I think there's a more educated way to do it. And that's why we have my guests here today, Joe and Chris with Lead Scout. And uh, we're going to talk about canvassing versus scouting and prospecting and the differences of those and how you can successfully do that and not just get out there and blindly knock doors. And um, so I'll give you guys the floor for a minute, introduce yourself, introduce Lead Scout for someone who maybe isn't familiar with what you guys do and, and we'll go from there. I'm Chris Ostra, <laughs> co-founder of Lead Scout. My role is sales, business development, partner relations, and we wear a lot of hats over here. We're still a small uh, SaaS startup, um, but we've been doing it for a few years and constantly trying to think of new ways to provide software in the lead generation space. We know that for any residential remodeler company or any company, leads and labor are key. And so we play in the lead space. So super excited to be here. Really thankful that Pete, that you invited us. And hopefully for those that are watching this, you can pull away some cool anecdotal tips and tricks to help your business. So good to be here. Yeah. And my name's Joe Salowitz and I've been hanging out with Lead Scout here for, uh, since the beginning. I'm one of the original founders. My background is technology, so I don't come from the roofing space, but I've been able to team up with some people who are way smarter than me and, and I can bring a little bit of a technology angle to it and help to build the product. And that's really what I'm focused on with Lead Scout. Um, so we've just, like Chris was saying, we've been trying to build a product that is really intensely focused on focused prospects prospecting in neighborhoods, in key areas to help sales teams be effective on the ground and not only effective, but just really focused. I think that's what we see is sometimes the, the project is too big, right? And so how can we get people really tactical, really small objectives to accomplish and then provide win in their sales along the way to help them be more successful? And that's really what we've tried to do with the product. So I guess I'll, I'm digressing on Lead Scout already, but I, I can give a quick high level of what Lead Scout is all about for those that don't know about it. So Lead Scout creates focused prospect lists, right? It creates those lists for your sales team. Uh, any any home improvement contractor, no matter what industry you're in, we do work with a lot of roofers, siding manufacturers, or we've got a, a partner in LP. And so we're working with a lot of siding contractors, but we really serve all of the home improvement industry. And so providing those focused prospect lists, we also serve up direct mail to those prospects to help provide boosts and boosted impressions in neighborhoods and in those localized areas to, to essentially be the win in the sales at the sales reps back so that they can enter a neighborhood or an area, know that their brand is already present uh, and start to, when they're saying hello to the couple people on the prospect list, it's not big list. Those few people on the prospect list, they can know that those people have already been exposed to the brand and they're already somewhat curated, qualified prospects. So we do that through a number of different mechanisms. And then of course, all of that is measurable and tracked on our platform. So you can manage it and measure your success over time. That's great. I mean, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, on this podcast, I mean, we've talked about lead gen a little bit and we've really focused on the tech side of it. And I think so many times now the idea is I'm just going to go like the tech approach. I'm going to focus on my website, my Google reviews, my digital marketing, my social. And I think sometimes we lose track of the fact that still the most effective is that in person or that close touch and the referral. I worked for on the CRM side and on the CRM side, the referral was still the number one way that anybody was gaining leads. No matter how much we track their leads, referrals was always their largest supplier of leads. Really, 
becoming like a neighborhood's roofer is a huge piece to this. And I think it's an overlooked piece. We go in, we do a job, we clean up and we leave and we go do the next job. And there may be 20 to 200 other houses in that neighborhood that all are potential customers. Like we have a lot of neighborhoods. I live in New Jersey and there's a lot of neighborhoods here that were built very much at the same time. If you get in there and one house needs a roof, odds are there's a bunch of other houses in that neighborhood that time line wise are probably due for a roof as well. So you could probably sweep up a lot of jobs right there in that neighborhood if you were to focus on just marketing around that job. And I think, and that's where, you know, potentially we're have contractors missing the boat there. They think of door knocking as just like, Hey, let's just go to a, a neighborhood and knock all the doors and see if we get anybody. And then we just move on to the next neighborhood, like the power model. I know we have guys that do it here. I've got guys probably once a month or so that come up the street and just say, Hey, we're in the neighborhood. We're knocking doors, looking at people's roofs. Can we do an inspection? Can we set up an appointment with you guys? And that's it. And then you don't see them for another couple of months. Then they cycle back through again and try it again. And I think that they're missing the point a little bit here. And that's what this conversation is about. You guys are employing a tool that allows you to, what we used to call in real estate circle prospect, right? Like you, you, farm around the area where you're selling a house or where you listed a house where you just had a buyer buy a house. Okay. I know that neighborhood's got houses for sale. Maybe there's some other people in the neighborhood that want to sell a house. Let's prospect just around where we're at. So speak a little bit to the differences and what you guys are seeing from a result standpoint of being more focused as opposed to that, just let's just wholesale knock a neighborhood and move on down to the road to the next neighborhood. Yeah. I'll take this one partly because I've knocked doors. I've gone door to door selling roof. In fact, that's how I got the start with Lead Scout. And I think, Joe, you said it, your intro is very eloquent. And to your point, Pete, there's this misunderstanding of what door knocking is or what could it, it could be. And when I was door knocking, we were, there was a storm that hit a city. I mean, we're based out of Michigan. So it was a city in Michigan, large hailstorm. And my task from the owner of the company, because I was an outside salesperson, was to go to that city and knock doors. That's a, that was a big ask. And there was a lot of opportunity, but the reality is I didn't really have guidance. It was just get out of your truck and start knocking doors. What we're trying to do with this more targeted, guided, focused approach is provide people like I was at that time with a list of homes that I know are receiving other impressions and branding so that when I walk up to the door, I'm much more recognizable and familiar. And so part of it is just like learning from talking to other contractors, the experience I had and saying, what if we gave the Chris Hofschers of the world a smaller list, not an entire city, right? Not even an entire development necessarily. Give them a smaller list, gave them the confidence that those homes were being impressed upon with professional marketing and brand recognition, and then just give them that guidance to say, here's where you're going to go. Here's the first one, the second one, the third one, and just prescribe that. Allow me to be more focused on how I hold and carry myself at the door and less about the bigger picture. Like where do I start? Where do I end? All of those things that are very overwhelming. And oftentimes I think is what prevents people from actually doing it, whether it's the there's such a huge difference, yeah, between yeah. those two approaches, right, Chris? Yeah. Just saying go out to a neighborhood or go out to a few homes. Yeah. So that, I would yeah, say, well, answer your question, Pete, it's hard to really measure the true difference, right? But it's more just the, the fundamental difference of saying, you know, what, I mean, anybody listening right now, like, what do you think the impact would be if you told someone to just blindly go out and hit an area, even if you know that area is like yeah. money versus yeah. prescribing them pre-created prospect lists and telling them, hey, big jumbo mailers and handwritten notes are being delivered to the same homes right now yeah. as you knock those doors. That's the world we're living in. And I think the easy answer is like, there's a lot better results there. Pete, do you live in a big development or how many homes do you have near, nearby you? I live in an older neighborhood. The homes are very close together mm -hmm. and there's a lot of houses. I would say like on our street. So I'm just thinking of the last guy that came through because I happened to be outside yeah. playing with the kids. 
I see this guy coming down the street. I can tell he's a door knocker and he's a roofing and siding guy because I stopped him and talked to him. And probably out of the, let's say on my street, there's 30 homes. I watched him have maybe two conversations and one of those lasted more than 45 seconds. So he had one meaningful conversation out of 30. Yeah. And I'm sure it didn't lead to anything. He just happened to catch that person and they sure. were friendly enough that they talked to mm -hmm. him. Like I don't, I, I never saw their sign go up on a house. So he didn't win any jobs on my street, but he was there for probably over an hour, mm -hmm. at least knocking doors. He was on one side of the street. There was another guy on the other side of the street. So they had two guys there for over an hour knocking doors with no results and, and no real, even like meaningful conversations, yeah. Yeah. really. You know what I mean? That was the biggest thing for me is to watch them work. It was, they just knocked all these doors. And if they're doing that, let's say it takes them an hour to do a street, they're doing eight streets a day. They're potentially having less than half a dozen meaningful conversations. And of those, maybe one is converting into a job if they're lucky. Is that really a great use of time? Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and so that was really, what struck me and it's like, we used to say it's the law of averages as the idea, right? Just knock as many doors as you can. And just by default, the law of averages will come into play and you'll win some yeah. of them. But I think the percentage of those that you'll win is so low in comparison to targeting. That's why like even Facebook marketing, right? Facebook marketing has such a demographic targeting capability that I can get down to age and gender and likes and dislikes and all kinds of things because hyper-targeting that market makes it more effective. So then why do we, when we go back to the traditional side of marketing, just go with this quantity over quality type of approach and just say, yeah, just go knock a neighborhood. Yeah. You'll probably get something. Yeah. It's, right? There's so many things at play and being smart about this. And I think too, so the Monday morning meeting with your sales team and you're saying, okay, here's our objective for this week. What does that look like? And I live in a neighborhood There's probably I'll say 120 homes in here, and it's called the Greenbrier neighborhood. And so if Monday morning meeting, they'll say, hey, Joe, go out and canvas the Greenbrier neighborhood. How am I supposed to fit in 120 homes over the course of my week when I have a million other appointments? It's not a focused objective list. And also it's just blind. There's not, to your point, there's, I don't know if I'm going to be knocking on a house that's a rented house or owner occupied. I don't know. Basically by, by looking at it, maybe I can tell if it needs some roofing services or gutter services or something. So that's good. But generally you're making those decisions on the fly, but it's an overwhelming thing. So you have to hit that whole neighborhood. But if we start with a job site, so let's start with a specific strategy. And we'll talk about job sites a lot today because that's, I think, what we're most thinking about these days. We could talk about storms or leads or re lead rehashing or thank you notes to existing customers. There's just a bunch of different tactics. But talking about job sites, that gives you a focal point. And you mentioned referrals earlier. Why are referrals so effective? It's because of trust. It's because you and somebody, if you've been doing your research, looking into some roofing services, you need a new roof. And then all of a sudden your best friend who you trust implicitly says, Hey, I use this company, loved them, had a great experience. All that research falls away. That company goes right to the top, right? Because you trust your friend. The same applies to job site marketing in a lot of ways or job site specific marketing to neighbors because a lot of times neighbors will say, I trust that person, or at least I know that person. And so if they're using this company, they must've done some research and I can see it in action. Hopefully they like their neighbors. But the idea here is this gives you focus and it gives you trust to leverage. And that's a great starting point. And so what you can do is you can really focus in on these key areas. Some people call it the eight pack, right? It's the few houses across the street, few houses to the side. It makes up an eight pack of homes. So take a six pack, hit the eight pack, and you'll be more successful because you're leveraging the trust that those neighbors might implicitly have with that home that is next door to them. And you're also just, it's super focused. It's so easy to go out, see the 10 to 20 houses around the neighborhood, say well, 10 of those I don't need to talk to because they don't. They just got new roofs and I'm going to, so I'm going to hit the other 10 and maybe leave a do door hanger or something. Uh, and it just gives you such focus and such targeting right out of the gate. I think to your example, you gave Pete, where you had one meaningful conversation of 30, but you could argue that though, if you were to do it every day, it would pay for itself, right? Like he, that person would make a living and the company would be happy. The challenge is, and we've, Joe and I've literally talked to, I don't know, probably thousands of contractors since 2019 and since we released our product, our first product. 
And you hear this kind of the same sentiments. A lot of what we're talking about here, and if we ever have an opportunity to talk to anybody listening, we're recycling the things we learned from you guys, and we're just substantiating it with a lot of different same voices. And the issue is replication of that one out of 30 every day. Like that just, it's a grind and it ultimately just stops. Whereas if the focus targeted nature, yes, but there's two different things happening. There's both a, an effectiveness measurement that has to happen. Like it is more effective. Yes. But then there's also, can I sustain that? Is it replicatable every single day, every single week? And can my team sustain that? And the answer on the, just blast the whole Greenbrier is no, it's just, it's a grind. So it's both a creating a mechanism that's replicatable and that's, that's achievable on a daily basis and both more effective because anything can be more, can be effective if done enough times. The problem is that the, the Greenbrier example, the example you gave Pete in your neighborhood is just not sustainable. And so inevitably it won't be effective. So that's a key thing to consider when you're doing any kind of marketing is the repetition of it and the ability to just keep doing it. Yeah. What I find always interesting when you see these posts on Facebook and you have these guys talking about, I'm a new contractor, what's the best way to get leads? How do I find more business? Whatever the case may be. And you get these guys to say, you just need to get out there and hustle and knock doors. It seems like anyone who's been in the business a while moves away from that exactly for that reason. Yeah, maybe that is because it's the obviously the cheapest way to get out there and find business. I'm not having to shell out a ton of marketing money. I'm not having to hire a marketing agency. Like I can just get in my truck, go to a neighborhood, get out and knock doors. So from a cost standpoint, if I am a new roofer or a one man show or something like that, yeah, it may be the most cost effective way, but but even so, there's a better way to do There's a more focused way to do it than to just randomly knock doors. And there's, like you said, that the inability to replicate it over a long term is without throwing a tremendous amount of people at it is why everybody eventually moves away from it. Like, it seems like the majority of roofers may start there, but they eventually move away from it to more tech savvy ways of getting to customers and or a combination of both, which I think is really the key piece that so many people are missing is they're making this wholesale change over to focusing on their SEO and hiring a marketing agency and building this super robust website and all these things. And they're missing the fact that you can very easily complement all of that stuff with what you guys are doing, which is like targeting direct mail. And you can drive them to the same place or you can drive them back. Because I think one of the things that you guys are doing and it really strikes me as a huge piece that's, I think, gets overlooked is the repetition of communication with that customer. I always use the, my neighbor getting a roof as an example. Like a year ago, my neighbor got a roof, old school roofer, guy's been in business like 25 years, doesn't do any, doesn't use any tech, right? Comes to the house, quotes my neighbor on a piece of paper while his guys are up there working the following day, two days later, whatever it was. He goes across the street, knocks on the neighbor's door, who I can tell you obviously is in need of a roof. And he goes across, he knocks on the door. He asks them if he could quote their roof. He gives them a quote and then never comes back. Never follows up, never comes back and asks them if he could do the roof, never comes back and says, Hey, do you want me to get up there and take another look at it? Nothing just completely ghosts them. And I guarantee you that if he would have come back a week later, two weeks later, whatever the case would have been, and followed up on that quote that he left, he would have won that roof 100% because it is in desperate need of a roof, that house. You know, it's an older home. All the houses in my area are older homes. And if he would have just stayed on top of that lead, he could have easily won it. And it would have cost him nothing because he was already here working. All he did was walk across the street and knock on the door. And that's more or less like what you guys are saying. That's the focused marketing. Like he had... At the time that he did my neighbor's roof a year ago, he probably had four houses that were in walking distance that he could have knocked on the door and probably won their roof that are in need of a roof right now. And he knocked on one and then never followed up on it. Crazy. Yeah, that's a tough nut to crack, right? Is that whole follow up thing. And so repetition is so key. I think a big problem we see a lot of times with contractors, they ask us, how do you grow your business and get prospects who 
you know, unlock the new prospect thing because there's the typical channels, right? You can advertise on billboards, TV, radio, etc. You can buy leads, usually are poor quality, it seems. And so that's the typical channels. But how do I like own that lead source? How do I really have some sort of spring, wellspring of of new prospects that are coming? And how do I establish myself as a local brand presence? And it, it's a, certainly a tricky thing to to tricky not to crack. But I think that the key here is that presence and that repetition. Being in the neighborhood and when you're on a job site, you're already in the neighborhood. So it's not a big deal to walk across the street. But then yeah, repetition, like you mentioned, we do a lot of direct mail to boost impressions in neighborhoods and in key areas of growth. So it's all about that localized brand presence, just being present all the time. You can do that physically by being in the neighborhood. You can do that with the perception of having yard signs or having your trucks in the neighborhood or utilizing direct mail. That's all just impressions to, to kind of emphasize that you're present. But then the repetition is such a key thing too. You have to do that over and over again, but it's really powerful. And that's really the way to unlock that, that spring of people saying, oh, that roofer, I need a new roof. Who's that roofer who is nearby? Who's that siding contractor that was nearby? I remember them because I've seen stuff. Maybe I wasn't paying attention a month ago, but I've seen it. I recognize the red and the blue, and that's the one I'm going to call first because they're first in mind. And obviously a shameless plug. Yeah, I think that. Shameless plug for lead scout. Go ahead, go this ahead. is my job to sell, Pete. Is <laughs> we can tell you guys that repetition is important. And many of you might be like, yeah, we know, right? Like that guy, the reason he didn't have repetition probably wasn't because he didn't think it was important because he didn't have a, a mechanism, a tool that helped guide him down that path. And I think at Lead Scout, we want to, again, recycle the information, the advice and the things that we're hearing from industry experts and from you guys out in the field. But we want to put that into an actionable software that you can use that will help you remind, help remind you, give you that guidance to say, you stopped out there, you marked that house as an opportunity, right? Remember, we're talking about focus prospect list. So let's say that was one of, is part of that focus prospect list. You marked it as a thumbs up or quoted or whatever, like we're going to remind you part of the experience that we're building is to remind you that home needs a reminder. Um, and so I think that's where we can help aid these owner operators. Joe and I are owner operators, right? And we know what it's like to do and wear lots of hats and many things. And oftentimes that's why we don't follow up because we're just doing a lot of things. Yeah. You know, and I think such a big piece of it that Joe touched on earlier is the trust factor and you have to build that trust and it's not going to happen over knocking a door once and having a conversation. It may take two, three, four times. What do they say? I think the ideal time, like I know when we were in sales, like when I sold CRMs, it was like eight touches, right? Like you had to touch them like eight times and it increased your chance every single time. So the follow-up was huge, right? But I think a lot of that is because you're building trust, you're building trust, you're building your credibility. And it, it goes back to what we talked about in a very early podcast about becoming the trusted roofer or like their neighborhood roofer. And we have it with everything else we do in life. Like if my car, I have a mechanic, I take it to the same guy because I trust him that he's gonna treat me fair, he's gonna do a good job. This is the reason why I go back to the same restaurants every time, because I trust that the food is gonna be consistent and it's gonna be good every time I go there. So we have it in every aspect of our life, except in this industry, we don't take that approach. Like we don't try to put ourselves in a position to become a long-term roofer or person, a trusted individual for that consumer. And it's not just for that person you did a roof for in this case, like it's becoming for that whole neighborhood. And that's like, I always go back to a contractor that I worked with a years ago who employed a maintenance program. So he would get you to buy a roof. And then if you bought a roof, he would enroll you in a maintenance program. And it was, I thought at the time, I was like, this guy's a genius because now he's going back to that same neighborhood two, three times a year. People see his truck, right? They're like, hey, why is that guy always back at your house? Oh, he just comes every couple of months. He just comes and gets up on my roof and checks to make sure everything's good. Really? I didn't even know you could do that. That's phenomenal. So then a year later, when I get hit by hail or I need a roof, I'm like, oh man, that guy's always here That's awesome. and he's always up on the roof and he's super trusted. Of course, I'm going to hire that guy. Like it makes perfect sense. So it's just a genius move by him to just stay present. And I think you can do it. Like you said, you can do it with signs. You can do it with your truck being in the neighborhood. You can do it with direct mail. Hey, here's a postcard. Wow. Like 
I heard from these guys a month ago and now they're hitting me up again. This is cool. These guys are like my neighborhood roofer, right? Maybe it's your just doing something like just touching base with them and not even really salesy. It's just to stay top of mind mm -hmm. so that when the time comes, there's no other roofer in their mind that they're going to go to, right? Like we obviously a roofer, we have a proposal software and we talk about when you go there to write a proposal, don't just quote the, if you're a guy that does multiple things, don't just quote the roof, right? Quote the siding, quote the fence, quote whatever other things, windows, doors, right? Because they may not need it right now, but they may decide two years from now they need it. And guess what? They know that you already quoted it. Oh, you remember that quote? He quoted us windows. Let's go back and look and see if it's still good. We'll call him because you're already, they know you're already in there and you've already taken a look at that stuff. You already know what they need. So we always try to push these guys when they quote to keep that in mind. Don't just quote a full roof replacement. Give them some options. Hey, here's a maintenance program you could do after you do a full roof replacement. Here's roof rejuvenation that potentially we could offer. Like here's all these other things that we could offer you that just give you options as a consumer, which makes you feel more comfortable with me as a roofer, mm. not just trying to wholesale get you for as much as I could possibly get you for, but it also extends your life with that consumer. Because now if something happens and I need a repair, Hey, that was my guy. He quoted me some repair work on that quote, even though I went with a full roof, he was cool about it. I trusted him. He made me feel good. So I'm going to probably go back there and I'm definitely going to suggest him to my friends. But it all loops back to that trust factor and building it by just being there, right? Like just being, like you said, being top of mind and being the guy that builds that credibility, whether it be by physically being there or being there through direct mail or whatever the case may be. That, uh, that thoughtfulness to the potential needs of, of homeowners is so key. And I'm such a sucker for that. I, we got to get a hitch for my wife's car. I was looking at installing it myself, but then was, thought I don't want to deal with that. So I looked into U-Haul <laughs> does it. Didn't know that. U-Haul does it. So I go online just to get a hitch. That's all I need. I just need a hitch. But their website has the UX of saying, here's a hitch. Here's the ball mount. You want some wiring? They got everything. There's six other options. Four hundred dollars later, I'm gonna get. All, I got it all. I got it all. <laughs> I didn't know I needed it, but I got it all. Because you yeah. know, I, you know, so I'll have a trailer next year or something like that, and I'll need the wiring. So that that type of such, I'm a sucker for that, a hundred percent. And the same thing goes for the roofing contractor I used on my house last year. I had a similar thing. It was here's the roof. Here's a maintenance package. Here's a couple other options. Do you want gutters with this? Do you want gutter covers? And they kind of would upsell pretty traditional sales and you just you never know what the homeowner's personality is going to be some people are certainly going to say no on all those fronts but you make an impression even if they say no um, or you're going to catch a sucker like me and i'm just going to say yeah full package of course i want the best <laughs> <laughs> no and it's true you definitely i think you even if they say no up front You've still at least put that thought in their head. Shoot, I didn't even know I, did, I needed yeah, gutters. I did gutters, uh, Mr. Roofer. Right. Thanks exactly. for offering. Yeah. Just education. Yep. A lot of the education helps too. Oh, I don't know what gutter covers are. But tell me more about that. And now you become an education resource for them. And they look at you, at, again, as a thoughtful contractor, somebody who really cares, which is great. Yeah. That's a huge piece. We stress that Nick that does my webinars here internally with me when we do our master classes is he's got this like coined phrase, transparency and education are the keys to making a sale. Being transparent as much as possible. And you, if you come out as that person who's, Hey, I'm here to educate you. I'm not here to sell you. It's going to, most of the time it's going to land you a sale, right? Yeah. So ups to Nick for his coined phrase, but it really is the truth. Like it's another story, another answer. <laughs> Uh, maybe telling too many of these, Chris, you can always cut me off, but we <laughs> bought a house recently in the last three years and right away it just needed a heater replacement. And I'm the kind of guy too, I like, I do my research. So I get down, I start Googling best heating systems, what's good in this year. And, and I'll spend a few weeks, month just doing that research. So I had a couple lists of manufacturers I was interested in, in looking into. Anyways, I get a guy to come out to quote, turns out they don't service that manufacturer that I was interested in, but he talks me through their partnering manufacturing company. I was skeptical at first, but then he's like, I used to sell for this manufacturer. I was a sales rep and here's why this company is the best. Here's what they did. Like they just changed their processes in this year and they changed out this equipment. And so they're actually in the producing stuff in Ohio. And so it's just higher quality, you know, manufacturer. And he just went through it all. And could speak to it from a personal lens and just of course he was selling me but he was also educating me and that's my heating and ac I, I he sold me an ac unit and a, and a heater as well and, and just even though i'd done all that research he just took the time to educate me and it really worked out obviously to benefit him as well as me i've been yeah. loving it
I think it's a much more impactful approach because like you said, it builds that trust factor and it also makes you have a comfort level with that guy that he's not just right. trying to sell you. He's not just trying to close business. Oh, he's actually yeah, looking out for my best interest here. And that's, that goes a long way, both in that sale and as a long-term customer. So. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's speak to, because I think, I thought this was very interesting when Chris and I talked about this, let's speak to the magic number that you guys have found, right? Like you guys talk about, we talked about canvassing or door knocking, and I'm knocking on this massive amount of doors, hoping to grab a few. And you guys have drastically targeted that number down to a very small number, very targeted number. So speak to what you guys in your research and talking with contractors, you guys have come up with a number, what, Chris, five, right? You guys hit five surrounding homes Eight, or more? 20. Yeah. So typically focus on 20 out of the game. I wouldn't call it a magic number so much as it's just a focus number. And Chris, you can pipe up and contribute here and talk more about the process, about how we arrive at that 20. I'll let you do that. Yeah, no, it's really just about creating a number that's digestible. Like Joe said, mm -hmm. it's not really so much like a magic number as, as much as we just felt like five wasn't enough and 40 is too much. You know, we're mentioned it a couple of times. It's all about creating a, a system, a process that can be replicatable. And if you have, say, 40 homes around a job site, 40 owner occupied prospects around a job site, that's just a larger number to go follow up on. And the key is following up on them. So we look at it, maybe the five that you were thinking about, Pete, was if you have 20, if we've identified 20 owner occupied homes around a job site, the idea is to challenge the contract or the contract challenge their, their salespeople in the field to find five to 10, right? That's where that five comes. Find, make it really achievable. Like, I dare you to find five homes that needed a roof out of these 20 neighbors that we're marketing to right now. So our marketing spend is much lower. It's much more palatable on the budget. And it allows us to deliver that list to, a, to our field people to say, go find five, right? I'm not asking to knock entire Greenbrier neighborhood. I'm asking you to introduce yourself to five of the neighbors around a job. So that's why... We pick those numbers, but of course, as we develop the accessibility of our software and we have more in diverse users and folks that want to do different things, you know, we'll, we obviously will let you do what you want to do. But in terms of creating a recipe that's pre-baked, we think 20 is the ideal and then allow the users to pick a number out of that. Yeah, just thinking about the process of, again, we're focused on circle marketing, what you call circle prospecting and job site prospecting. The process that somebody would go through is, so you have your job site address, just look around you. What homes are to your left, to your right, across the street? A lot of times in a suburban area, the ones that are realistically going to be neighbors, if you will be between 10 and 20. Once you get over that, you're probably dealing with people who don't know that neighborhood very well. You're probably getting off the street a little bit. And if you're in a rural area, we actually limit the, the you, know, you can limit the scope of mileage too. So you don't, there's going to be less homes, of course, in a rural area, but the homes that are five acres away, 10 acres away, a half mile down the street, they probably still know that house. Rural folks tend to be more spread out, but they do know their neighbors even despite that. So you base it on mileage then. Yeah. But the process would be you have the job site, look at the neighbors. Okay. Then the next thing is you don't want to you don't want to start marketing to renters. So verify owner occupancy. And there's tons of data services to, to, to do that. So you take the list that you've generated, you, you've recorded that, and I run it through a data source to verify owner occupancy. And then after that, you're going to want to time some sort of impression boost in that area, right? So that's either being present. We talked about this already. When does your job start? Let's say it's in two weeks. So before that starts, start hitting the neighborhood with, put your yard sign in the yard, get your trucks in and out of that neighborhood send some postcards, put door hangers. If you're in the neighborhood, just hang up some door hangers. Just be present, build impressions, and do that before, during the job, and after the job. The multiple drips thing is key too. Like you got to have multiple touch points. We talked about repetition. That's super key. And, and time that around that kind of that four to six week window around the job happening. And then make sure that you're, you're present in that neighborhood during that time. So sales reps should be, of course, when they're on the job and checking out the job site, just look around at those homes. You say, what are, which ones are good prospects? And maybe you've already done that. 
and go up and just say hello and say, hey, we're going to be here. It's going to be noisy. It might be a little bit messy. If you need anything, call me personally. I'll take care of it. I'll make sure that you guys are taken care of. You don't even have to sell them. Just say that you're there, you're present. And then after everything is done, job's cleaned up, you've stopped marketing to the neighborhood, you've pulled your yard sign up or your the homeowner's pulled the yard sign up, maybe head back over there and say, hey, I just want to say, did everything go well? Thanks for being patient with us. And here's a $5 gift card for your being a good neighbor. You can really, and then you can say, I'd quote your stuff. You can quote them right on the spot too. I see you have some gutter issues. Let me quote that for you. And just, again, be present in the neighborhood. Those are really the two, two key touch points there is when the job is happening, make sure you're saying hello and saying we're going to be noisy. And then after everything's wrapped up, say, thanks for your patience. Thanks for bearing with us. We're here if you need anything. And then the boost of those impressions along the way will just, nobody's going to forget that in that neighborhood. And chances are you're going to surface the lead. So we see some, using that approach, we see some pretty good results for building your business and you're growing your base of prospects. Yep. I love it. I love the credibility piece to it of going over there initially and not trying to sell them. Just like a, hey, I'm here just so you know. This is why our trucks are parked in front of your house. And we're not really trying to like hard sell you at that point. We let you build that comfort level with us first. Then we go and try to approach you with the sales end of it. Yeah. I like the idea of not having to tackle this huge amount. Like what Chris said, Hey, well, I'm going to give you 20. I challenge you to find five from a sales rep standpoint, right? Like that's a lot easier lift for me to go out every day with a list of 20 and try to come up with five as opposed to, Hey, you guys go hit these hundred or 200 homes and see what you can come up with. Yep. That's a much more overwhelming task for a salesperson. So I love the targeting piece of that from their standpoint. Like it's a much more, if I'm a sales rep, that's a much more realistic goal to me to go out and be like, okay, there's 20 people that we've already qualified as decent leads. Like finding five of those and having a meaningful conversation should be fairly easy. Yeah. We, we like to yeah. call it scouting, but it's just different. It's not the same thing. We're not asking people to canvas. We're asking people to be intentional about just being present. Yeah. 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 It's completely different mindset altogether yep. to take out there. So yeah, we get a lot of pushback at first when we first use, if we ever use that word and I'm guilty of using it all the time and they'll say, well, we don't canvas and not. That's not what actually we're asking you to do. It's a different mindset, as you said, Pete, totally. One other thing I wanted to just mention in terms of the bigger picture, lead generation should really be looked at as like lead cultivation. Ask any company that's reached 15, 20, 30 million, right? It takes, it's a lot of small pushes of a flywheel over time. I think, can't remember the author, but good to great talks about that. And so when we think about lead generation, if we look at it like, like a, a going to the casino where it's red or black and you win or you lose, like you can win, of course, but you have to make sure that you're incorporating tactics that are more like farming, right? More like working the ground, working the soil, the land, so that over time you produce better and more fruitful crops. And so if we think about these targeted prospect lists, what does that allow us to do over time? And it gives us something to follow up with every season. So if we're focusing on that neighborhood and letting them know that we're the trusted local siding company or roofing company, we may close some jobs, we may not. But now that neighborhood's primed for the fall. Like we're in Michigan here. So we have these seasons. Fall time is going to be great to, to follow up with all of those different neighborhoods. And then springtime, do that again and just continue to cultivate that branding in those specific areas and just remind them, don't forget, I was the person that, that did that, that job that was trusted in that neighborhood. So again, if you're focusing on those small bite-sized pieces, being able to do those follow-ups becomes more financially and economically viable too. If we're just doing these massive campaigns, that's a costly endeavor to follow them up every year or twice a year versus taking bite-sized chunks out of these targeted lists. Yeah, I love it. I think it's a great idea. And I think it's great knowledge for the newer roofer, right? To say you don't have to necessarily spend a lot of time and money, but you can really be more focused about your lead gen and about your marketing, I, the idea behind your marketing or how you're going to generate leads and to just focus on being smarter about it 
than just being, it's not a numbers game necessarily. You can do quality over quantity. And I think that's a piece that a lot of new roofers struggle with. Where am I, like you said, where am I going to get new prospects from? How am I going to generate business? How am I going to be competitive? And these are all ways to do that. I'm not just knocking on the same door that the guy knocked before me who has been in business 20 years and I've been in business for five minutes. Like now I can really like target areas and build that trust, build that credibility that I don't have maybe because I'm a newer roofer. So I really love this for the newer guys or the smaller businesses that are trying to break into an area. Like a roofer, that's our bread and butter is a small to medium sized roofers. And I think this is just gold for them. But like, this is really great knowledge for them to utilize because they don't have big marketing budgets. They don't have the ability to necessarily have a big marketing agency that's handling their, you know, SEO and their social and all that. So they're looking for ways to generate quality leads. And this is a great opportunity to do that and a great tool to do it. We wondered, so when COVID started, everybody was wondering what was going to happen, right? So people freaked out a little bit and thought leads were going to dry up. And then obviously the opposite happened as time went on. And so we wondered along the way, will people continue to come back to Lead Scout, the company that primarily focused on lead generation? And what we found was interesting in that the value that we were providing as a company wasn't so much just a constant stream of leads as much as it was constant presence in neighborhoods and brand exposure. And that was this intrinsic value. We actually didn't experience the dips that we expected in a lead rich environment. We didn't experience a huge dip and that people continued to continue to utilize our services. And that was a really interesting thing. But I think we're starting to see it switch again. There's a lot, people are getting skittish again about the economy and about what's ha- what's coming is, are we going to see a slowdown? What all this stuff is being talked about. And it's a really interesting time to be in the lead generation space. And we've heard some contractors and we've had contractors come up to us and say, I just really want to focus right now. The storehouses have been full for the last two, three years, five years, but I haven't really owned the process around that. I've just sat back and it's happened organically. I want to prepare and steal my business for the times that are not good, that are that where the storehouses are empty. I need to be able to know that the the inflow of grains into my storehouses are coming from sources that I own or I trust or I have control over. I have to be in control of those processes. And so we've been working over the last few months with a number of contractors that have had that mentality and that approach. Um, and it's really been interesting. And, and that's really where we're passionate is trying to figure out how to build, give contractors the ownership of their lead source and make sure that those leads are quality. They can rely on them over time. I love that. That's a great point. Yeah, that's huge. Cool guys. I really appreciate it. We're coming up on time here. So I really appreciate you guys coming on. I think, like you said, this is a great topic. I love it for all roofers in general, but specifically those smaller guys that I think are looking for a better way to garnish some leads and produce quality leads. And they don't have the ability, that power home model, I don't have 200 feet on the ground that I can send out there to knock a huge neighborhoods. So how do I do it? And I think this is a smart way of doing it. And it's proven to be a successful model in other businesses. Like I mentioned real estate earlier, it's one of the most effective ways to, to sell houses is to do this kind of circle prospecting or circle marketing around your listings and things like that. So it's a proven model. It's not anything new here. And it's something that I think we just haven't necessarily utilized as best as we can as a roofing industry. And I think that you guys have built a tool that really helps the contractor to do that. And I think it's going to be hugely successful for you guys, but also for the roofers that use it because it is just a smarter, more efficient way of doing it. We hope so. Thanks for having us on, Pete. We really appreciate this time and and a lot of respect for Roofer and what y'all are doing in the industry. Thank you so much for giving us some time just to talk about what we love to do and what we're passionate about. Yeah, I really appreciate you guys coming on and uh, hopefully we can do it again soon.